joining us in this space um, as we navigate the conversation around um, how to be um, an ally in, in this movement towards anti-racism. Um, so no longer just being an ally and um, um, but really, really, and being an ally to all, of course, but really being an ally and, and holding accountability for ourselves um, as we make shifts and as we as we really move towards anti-racism. Um, there's a lot of intentionality. Um, a, today, we're going to talk about the notion of, of how we hold ourselves accountable and, and the steps we can take, the resources we should all be utilizing um, in this process. Um, and I will just say there's intentionality in the fact that um, Aaron and I are holding this space um, as the facilitators for all of you. Um, so we both identify as um, white individuals. And the reason for us leading this space is really the notion um, to one, I think if you were at Dr. O'Reilly's um, you know, keynote uh, the previous hour, you really heard, and, and I, I believe by now know the hurt and pain that so many communities of color are experiencing. So just thinking about the anti-Asian violence and discrimination that we are seeing, um, the shootings of black individuals, as well as disproportionate number of BIPOC community that are dying because of COVID. Um, so just the ongoing racialized discrimination and violence we're seeing, it feels really important that we came here and, 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 and are speaking to you and, and um, us putting the labor on ourselves um, to be holding this space and, and not on those that are already experiencing the pain and already experiencing the hurt. Um, it's also really important um, that we then take this time to educate ourselves again and really keep ourselves accountable in this process of working towards anti-racism. In the process, it's important that we have direct conversations around any racism um, as a way to increase our own awareness, to create one and increase one another's awareness, and just really then to be able to ultimately challenge the systemic racism, anti-Blackness, anti-Asian that we are seeing um, throughout our world right now. So again, really having conversations about it and starting that process. Before we get there, and again, similar to kind of what Dr. O'Reilly was speaking about in her presentation, when she spoke about this notion of having first the understanding of history before we make movement, before we start the movement and take action, really having an understanding. For, so we're going to take some time to really um, talk about the historical pieces around um, white supremacy and racism um, before we think about, you know, even the action we can take. Um, and this is a way to, to not cause further harm, but instead really to listen, slow down and, and learn in this process. So we're really, really happy for all of you to be joining us in the space. I think as a part of welcoming folks into this space, we just wanted to um, first check in to see if anyone would want to share either verbally or in the chat, what brought you to this workshop today? Was there something that that made you feel pulled to to want to be a part of an anti-racist allyship workshop. Hi, um, I, I'm Royce Jones. I work in the Career Management Center out of the Business School, and I would say probably uh, ninety percent of my students, and I don't know if it's quite that high, but a high percentage of my students are from all cultures, walks of life, races, and and I really want to embrace that um, that understanding and safe space in, in the students that I deal with in just a, um, you know, like she was talking about, you know, where they go to school and it seems like you're in this alternate universe and then you go back to your life. And I want to be able to um, not have my interactions with students be an alternate universe that that it, that I'm aware of and and am actually um, in support of of them as well. I appreciate you sharing that and. Uh, some of the themes I see. So I'll just so folks know if you post in the chat, I may read some of the themes out, but I won't pair it um, with anyone's name specifically. But um, you're know, hearing a comment around, you know, feeling though maybe one identifies within BIPOC community. And so um, if anyone's not familiar with that term, then BIPOC is Black Indigenous and People of Color. Um, you know, even within community, there's always more to learn about being actively anti-racist um, and to listen to other people's thoughts. I'd compare, learn something new, 
want to be more of an ally, um, yeah, working in undergraduate recruitment, want to find realistic ways to support others as an ally. I think that will certainly a part of, be a part of this conversation is the concrete, specific things folks can do. I think that's what we hear sometimes is folks have sort of the sense of, of urgency. I need to act. I need to be doing things to promote um, equity and anti-racism, but maybe not being quite sure where to start. And so we really want to provide um, a starting point for folks. Well then, holding time, maybe I'll, I'll shift it to you to really get us started in that content, Jenna. Yeah, and really just already seeing through people's words and descriptions, just this notion of the call to yourself of like, how do I do this? And and I don't know about any of you, but there's, there is like, there's can feel this sense of urgency of, of wanting to show up. And, and we do, we hope we can give you some tangible things today, even if like, oh, I could shift even this one way that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to this person or the ways I'm showing up and supporting them um, that could, I think, ultimately land and in, in having, in having big impact. Um, so yeah, certainly, Educating ourselves is really important, but of course, then showing up and, and recognizing um, the ways in which we listen and learn too. So it is first so important, as we noted, to have an understanding of the historical pieces of this. So I, I've already seen you know people talking about white privilege and um, you know wanting to learn more and wanting to learn how to be a better ally. It's really important that we understand though the foundation of this and in the historical pieces. Um, and so this is where we talk about white supremacy and, and systemic oppression institutionalized um, racism um, that occurs and, and occurs in every system. So I think that's also important to note is we are not um, we are not um, unique. Uh, we don't we are not an outlier. Um, this this exists in every system and we're going to be talking about many so that it, it can really kind of be understood the ways in which it shows up. Um, I really um, appreciate this definition of it by Francis Lee Ansley, which says, um, and this is about white supremacy and systemic oppression, is a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources. Conscious and unconscious white ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and relations of white dominance and non-white support nations are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions in social settings. So I'm just going to drop that into the chat for those to have that and see it, but really just showing and talking about the notion that this really is widespread. This is everywhere, and I apologize for the formatting of that. That's not ideal, but that is there. It's important to understand this notion of whiteness because lots of times we can, I think, get caught up in, in looking at individual whiteness. Oh, this one person acts this way, but I don't. But what we have to understand is whiteness in general is something that has become was sort of became and was constructed as an ideal in our society it is the foundation of so many of our systems and our policies is this notion of white idealism this notion of white supremacy and in turn what that happens is that then causes the oppression that then causes systemic oppression and racism these, this shows up, just so you're aware and kind of can think about this, this shows up as lower employment rates for many minorities, um, thinking about, you know, Black Americans specifically. Companies are more likely to call applicants for an interview based on the resume if they, if the name is assumed to be a white person um, versus um, someone who identifies as a different race. Um, thinking, think about the impact of having to hide one's identity in that way. You know, how is someone's name coming across and the notion that that might impact um, the type of job they could get, um, the type of, of, of home they could buy. There's many individuals that say they've put in offers to homes and they don't get them. And then by chance, like, you know, there's been studies shown that the same offer could go in for the home and it was more of a white appearing name and that person got the house. So just really thinking about the ways that ha that happens. Um, I'm also just thinking about the notion and um, that, you know, this comes this comes in all different types of levels of our system. So thinking about also not only again in, in thinking about how this shows up in employment and jobs, um, so underrepresentation of jobs, payment and jobs, um, it also shows up in the ways we then treat different groups of individuals. So um, Asian individuals being called a disease this past year while out in public, hearing racial slurs, experiencing acts of violence. A disproportionate number of people of color um, 
are homeless or lack housing security in part due to the legacy um, of redlining. Um, and, and so, you know, this notion that um, we continue to see how people of color and how marginalized folks are oftentimes systemically in our society continue to sort of be put, um, you know, is marked as, as inferior, treated as inferior. Less funding allocated towards non-white schools, uh, a Latinx person being told to go back to their country or being discouraged from speaking their native language, over-representation of Black Americans in prisons. Um, they're much more likely also to be denied bail uh, compared to their white defendants, um, more likely to receive harsher charges and sentences. Overall lack of health care coverage. Um, so we have seen this so much this past year, but this was of course present even before that, but um, you know, the difference in, in the impact of COVID um, and who was more likely to be hospitalized and die and seeing more of that within people of color. Uh, also, of course, just thinking about police violence and how that shows up. So again, just thinking about this, this notion that there is this sort of that sort of there is this this white supremacy, this white idealism that idealism that is woven throughout so many of our systems and our things. And even if maybe you can't um, necessarily relate to some of these things, so thinking about maybe the prison system, you could certainly relate to um, the medical system and, and your health care. Um, you can understand and relate to how this applies to our educational systems. But you can also think about how this applies in other ways. Um, the ideals around how we, we talk, um, how we dress, um, societal norms that are really interwoven with these white ideals. So again, just this importance of understanding the framework, the foundation that's been created. There are, of course, also very overt examples of violence and racism. Of course, thinking about police violence, as I've named, um, and also systemic oppression. So again, not believing people of color when they seek health care, um, lack of access to housing jobs, harmful discriminatory language that's used. So again, there's these un, there's sort of like these unconscious or not as overt ways that are sort of woven throughout the system. And then of course, these very, very overt ways that we see. I think when we think about all of this, what's so important to think about is the notion that we all have a different starting point. So if we are aiming for equality and treating all equal, it's it's actually then ignoring the notion that people of color have had a different starting point in our society due to systemic racism, due to systemic oppression, and the values around white supremacy. So again, really understanding that actually our goal is for equity. Our goal is actually to take in consideration one's identity um, and, and really creating equity in that standpoint because we all have had a different, a different starting point. So I'll pass it over to Erin now. Mm -hmm. I think some of the examples that Jenna is giving around like having racial slurs um, thrown at someone, acts of violence, those are a few, certainly obviously not an exhaustive list of experiences and examples of racism and white supremacy. And um, I think something that we want to make sure we're having in this conversation is this idea that if we only pair racism, like the word racism or the idea of racism or white supremacy with acts of violence or what to potentially, you know, white identified people feels like overt discrimination towards BIPOC folks, there may be this assumption like, well, then surely I have never engaged in racism. Like maybe I could never engage in racism or be a part of a larger system of racism or inequity. And I think that's what a lot of people think of. Like, well, I have never yelled a racial slur at someone, so surely I am not engaging in racism. Or, you know, on an individual level, people may feel very disconnected from the funds that go to particular schools or to employment rates. Like, that's not connected to some decision I made, so I must not be contributing to racism. So we want to continue to even give some more examples of, um, of microaggressions. It's not even necessarily a microaggression, really, it's just racism, right? And overt examples of racism. So other examples could be things like a store owner follows a person of color around a store because they look suspicious. And what is the messaging around that, right? The message is, I assume you will steal something, right? And so many, so many BIPOC folks have shared this to be an experience that they've had, not once or twice, but maybe many times throughout their lives. Um, a person of color being questioned outside of their home or when they're staying at an Airbnb for vacation due to assumptions that they don't belong there. And what is that assumption based on, right? It's based on um, their identity or assumptions about their identity. 
Another example of racism is when stories are run like on the news regarding individuals accused of a crime and looking at the differences in how those individuals are portrayed, right? So potentially using a mugshot for a person of color and yearbook photos of a white individual. Um, racism can be things like asking to touch the hair of a black individual. So this can absolutely be experienced as an invasion of personal space. And it also connects to the history of the black community being seen as um, curiosities or without full rights to their own bodies. So that's, um, there, there is a lot of layers to that, to, to asking to touch someone's hair or just ask, or just touching someone's hair without any consent. Um, racism can look like um, very specifically, suddenly you know, clutching one's bag or moving really far away if you're even in proximity to a, um, a black man or to a person of color, assuming that they are a threat. Um, racism can look like not making an effort to accurately pronounce someone's names once we're corrected, right? Just kind of saying something like, oh, well, close enough, right? That That's too hard for me to try to pronounce that name. Um, saying things like, you're, um, you're so articulate. That is a phrase that's really problematic because the message there is it's unusual for someone of your your race, your background, your identity to be intelligent. Um, using language like, oh, that's a that's a bad neighborhood. So what do we mean when we say that? Right? I mean, if you, if you realize in this moment, hmm, I've said that before, give some thought to what did you mean by that? What were you referring to? Like often that is referring to communities of folks who um, have lower income or are you know, from particular identities and from particular communities and associating um, racial identity or, you know, being a person of color with being bad, right? And so I think that is something I hear with a lot of frequency. Um, I don't see color. So there's um, the message there, it denies the individual as a cultural being um, and the impact that uh, race and racism has on a person's life. So people may be well-intentioned in trying to say, I don't see people differently. That may be what you're trying to get across, but by saying that we don't see someone's race or ethnicity, um, it doesn't mean they stop experiencing racism. So we need to be validating that racism is real and frequent and pervasive. I saw a comment in here. Um, yes, great examples. So I see an example of you know, students in universities are regularly told to adopt an Americanized nickname to be more um, successful in their job search. Yeah, I think that, that is a message that a lot of students at UTP do get with a lot of frequency that they should make shifts to their names, that it is easier on other people. And when I think about how problematic that is and how connected to identity and culture and family that names are and how much importance that they can carry. So for to ask us, for us to ask someone to just not use that name anymore, really think about um, the messaging behind that. Um, so as folks who are wanting to commit to engaging in anti-racism, it is really critical that we disentangle ourselves from this belief that we as individuals couldn't possibly be engaging in racist behaviors and increase awareness of the many ways that we likely do perpetu perpetuate racism through our language or through our beliefs, through our actions. And so an important you know, part of recognizing the way that we all have a role in perpetuating systemic oppression and racism is understanding our own privilege as white individuals. And so Jenna's going to lead us through a number of examples of this in just a moment. But I think something, you know, before we talk about white privilege, I think we do want to first make a note that having white privilege does not mean that, that a white person does not ever experience marginalization related to other identities. So having privilege, and whether it's white privilege or other forms of privilege that folks may hold, it doesn't mean that you have never struggled. It does not mean you have never faced discrimination. It doesn't mean that you have never worked hard. But it does mean, with white privilege, it does mean specifically related to race and ethnicity, we have a number of built-in advantages that do significantly impact how we navigate the world. And so I will frequently you know, share myself out as an example. So I am a disabled woman and you know, disability, like my identity as disabled, that is a marginalized identity that greatly impacts how I navigate the world, but I'm also a white disabled woman. And so I really, as I'm you know, holding you know, pieces connected to uh, identity as a disabled person, there are so many ways in which 
you know, white identity and privilege connected to that has shaped the way that I have navigated the world. And so I, uh, it is important for me to be owning that and recognizing that um, in addition to. So, um, yeah, let shift it over to you, Jenna. Thanks for that, Erin. Um, yeah, and I, I think that is so true. Like, again, I think there can initially sometimes be this um, internal discomfort around this. And, and again, what we'd ask is like, lean into that. Um, this certainly doesn't mean you also haven't gone through hardships or, or um, it's not about who necessarily you are. It is about this invisible knapsack though, that we carry as white individuals that, that gives us some immediate privileges as we navigate this world. Um, as I share out some of these and state some of these um, examples of white privilege, I really encourage you um, to think about what's standing out to you, um, any that feel new or surprising, any that feel like, you know, pretty solid example for you, true to you, any others you'd add to the list. So certainly utilize the chat if you'd like. Um, again, we're not we're not going to um, be, be speaking anyone's name or anything like that. Um, but, you know, just even if you want to share what is coming up for you as, as I go as I go through these. So the first is if I wish I can arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. I can go shopping alone most of the time and generally feel confident that I will not be followed or harassed due to my race. I can turn on the television and see people of my race widely represented. I can do well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race. I'm never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. I can go home from most meetings of organizations I belong to feeling somewhat included rather than isolated, out of place, outnumbered, unheard, or held at a distance or feared. I will feel welcomed and normal in the usual walks of public life, institutional and social. I can pre find products for my hair in an aisle labeled hair care rather than a smaller selection of products in a separate aisle. I can stand in my driveway or drive in my neighborhood without worry. I will be questioned as to why I'm there thinking about the recent acts of violence towards API community, also many people afraid right now to even leave their house, specifically related to fear that they will be targeted or harmed based on their race. So again, just in general, I can stand in my driveway, I can go to a grocery store and not be feared that things will be said to me, that people will look at me or stare at me. I can generally assume I will be taught by and could easily find mentorship from someone who looks like me. I think we hear this a lot in education. Is our student body mirrored by the staff and faculty that are teaching them, that are counseling them, um, that are you know providing service to them? I have not had to worry that I wouldn't receive a job interview based on my name alone. Flesh colored or nude bandages and shoes are similar. To when I go to a new class or job, I can typically assume there will be other people of my race also there. And I can turn away from my social media and take a break if feeling fatigued from conversations about racism. So take a moment to take those in and wondering if anyone does want to share in the chat what comes up for you. If there's others that feel true to you. If there's ones that felt new to you. I think one that really stands out to me and just feels really, um, you know, in really kind of present in our lives right now is this notion that I think for, for probably most of us, um, at least at some point this year, if not still currently, it can feel really um, uncomfortable going out, right? Like there's still such a scare of just even the pandemic and 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 that alone and, and being in, in large groups. And then to add the additional layer of one's identity and what that means, you know, I, I think just sitting with that notion of already, again, the fear and anxiety that is coming with navigating our world, and then to think that like that could also be met with an additional layer of, of lack of safety. So a lack of physical safety, no longer just health, but even physical safety, or the notion that one could be called out or, or something cruel said um, to them in a grocery store. That, again, their safety um, 
could be threatened is, is, is just, it's really a lot when we think about those additional layers. Mm. Yeah, so it was just noted with these examples, it reminds me of some things I've seen growing up as a kid. It makes me curious on whether these are, there's a place for conversation to start in the family. Mm -hmm. Will there be talks about how to raise a family with privilege checks or ideas of anti-racism? I sure hope so. I think you're bringing a, I think you're bringing um, a wonderful point. I think us as allies and allies in the anti-racist movement, no matter what identity we do hold, that is our calling, right? As, as whether we start our own families or we're having these conversations within our families that potentially hold some racist beliefs or beliefs built upon white oppression, um, that we could be um, talking about those things. I'm also hearing about, yeah, the notion of even just thinking about that you haven't had to think about some of these things ever before. So yeah, it's it's that notion of sitting in that privilege. If I've never even realized I, I about hair care, right? Um, and again, yeah, really shows that systemic racism is there. I think the the last comment that I see really connects to what I'm about to transition into. And so I really appreciate you sharing that. And I can hear you saying there's even like some vulnerability in sharing that out, but there is a question or you know acknowledgement of you don't realize you're participating or experiencing that you're benefiting from white privilege until necessarily it's pointed out. And so, um, you know, there's a question around like, should I feel shame for that? I think that something that, you know, Jen and I really do want to reiterate is with with white privilege, it, it is these unearned benefits, right? These things that you do not have to do anything for that is inherently built in uh, for someone who is white, you know, because of white supremacy, because of systemic oppression, and because it is so normalized. It is so normalized, like this is what's considered typical or normal. It may be outside of your awareness. You may navigate your day, day to day, and not recognize, oh, for someone else, for someone else in this community, they may navigate this situation with a lot of fear, right? Or be in danger that I don't. So that's not necessarily always in your awareness. Um, and so I think part of this process is then developing that awareness. And so there's a quote by Ajioma Oluo that says, white privilege is a risk to the anti-racist movement because if we aren't aware of our privileges, we may dismiss systemic oppression or racism we observe. And if we aren't willing to explore and understand the impact of our privilege on BIPOC, it slows down the work towards fighting racism and white supremacy. So it's that idea of because it's so outside of folks' awareness, there may be a knee-jerk reaction to say, no, that can't be happening. Surely that's not what's going on. If you haven't experienced it yourself, if it's not a part of your day-to-day -day life, it may be hard to believe because a lot of the examples that folks are experiencing are horrifying. And so that may be hard to emotionally um, come to terms with. But white privilege is something that we can use to benefit the anti-racist movement. It doesn't have to be something that is slowing it down because white individuals have access to people and to places that BIPOC folks might not. White individuals may be taken more seriously um, by those in power, may be able to challenge injustices in their workplace and take more overt actions against racism that may carry less risk for those of us who are white individuals. So a white individual, it may feel uncomfortable. We may feel worried about how our extended family members on our social media might respond, um, but inherently it is likely to be less risky to our jobs and our lives to challenge uh, racism. So um, I think to connect to the question that was brought up, it's not uncommon that in learning about white supremacy and racism, white individuals may get stuck in feelings of shame because it can pull, pull up feelings of shame of, oh, I've said that thing before. Oh, I've engaged in that behavior before. And so you may notice shame for yourself and that's important to notice. What we don't wanna do is then get stuck in it and not be able to move forward. It's really important to have that awareness, have that reflection, and then be able to commit to doing things differently and acting differently. It's never too late to get unstuck and to take different actions. And so I'm gonna share out some general ways to engage in anti-racist allyship and then Jenna will talk more specifically how we can react when we get feedback or when we get called in um, by folks. And so just thinking about some more broad ways to engage in anti-racism, one of the first things that comes to mind is to believe people um, when they tell you about their experiences of discrimination. So there's 
I really, really frequently see the phrase, why does everyone have to make it about race, right? So someone will share an example of racism and then a response might be, why are you making it about race? And so um, Abram X. Kendi has a quote, denial is the heartbeat of racism. Racist is not the worst word in the English language. It is not the equivalent of a slur. It is descriptive. And the only way to undo racism is to consistently identify and describe it and then dismantle it. So the attempt to turn this usefully descriptive term into an almost unusable slur is, of course, designed to do the exact opposite, to freeze us into inaction. So I think when people hear the word racism, hear white supremacy, they get frozen into an action because they want so badly to not be connected to it, to not be associated with systemic oppression. So I think part of trying to get unfrozen, trying to get unstuck is to try to think through our own prejudices and really examine those more. So to think through what are the messages that I received growing up related to race, ethnicity, to country of origin? What sorts of things did I hear from my family, from my community, from my peers. Um, you know, even if you're very committed to engaging in anti-racism, you have been shaped by your culture. We've been shaped by our society. Everyone holds prejudices. Everyone holds unconscious biases we're not aware of or we're missing um, because we don't hold a certain identity. So if we are not a part of a certain community, we simply are going to be missing things about their experiences because that's not part of our day-to-day -day lives. So it's important for us to hold, um, to be humble about that, right? To hold awareness of, I surely can't know everyone's lived experience so that connects back to, so then I should believe them, right? I should believe other people when they're sharing what's happening for them. It is really important that we're talking about racism with family and friends, you know? Are we, I only have thoughts on the, the murder of Breonna Taylor. Am I bringing up those thoughts explicitly with my friends? Am I sharing out resources with other people on how to support um, API Asian community? Am I initiating those conversations with people in my life? Even if I feel nervous to do so, am I still doing it, kind of making those conversations happen? Um, another way would be to, and I realize I'm going through this so quickly, it's just we know that, that time is flying by and we really wanna make sure we share out all these resources. Um, but another example would be, we really want to bring attention to racism, to inequality, to discrimination when we observe it in our relationships, when we observe it in school and work, um, in social media. So if you observe a white person who's playing devil's advocate, I think mean, I'll hear that pretty frequently, but they're doing it to criticize a person of color. Like, well, let me just give another perspective. Let me just play devil's advocate here. To, to name that and to um, share some curiosity on what is the intention behind that? What is that for? We really need to be addressing racist language and acts and others. So if we observe that a woman of color is being spoken over in a meeting or her ideas aren't being taken seriously until they're voiced, the same ideas voiced by a white person, this is very, very common. If we observe that playing out, to not sit in silence around that, but to name that, to share concern about that um, openly, to be talking about that. You, if you hear someone say, wow, they sounded so articulate when referencing a black individual, to give feedback about that, to explain this is a harmful thing to say. It connects to a history of people being surprised um, if someone who's a person of color is speaking well, like giving feedback, explaining, and giving that psychoeducation because some people may not know, right? And so if they don't know, you can intervene in that moment. You can help them to know and to recognize why that's really harmful. And then the last uh, point I'll make around some of the broader, more general ways that we can be um, engaging in anti-racism would be to elevate the voices of people of color. So you know, Jenna shared at the beginning the intentionality and why this particular training was being facilitated by white facilitators um, in attending to like the emotional labor that so many folks of color are already putting into um, giving resources and training and things like that. But in as many opportunities as we can, allyship does look like highlighting the work, the contributions, the voices of people of color um, versus really wanting to put a spotlight on the anti-racist work that white folks are doing. So um, I think it, 
elevating the voices of people of color for students. So if there's any students in this call today, it could be kind of giving thought to who makes up the leadership in your student orgs or in the groups you're involved in on campus. It could be sharing social media content from folks of color. Um, it can be you know, elevating the voices of people of color, maybe monitoring your own participation in meetings. So if you're in staff meetings or faculty meetings, you know, um, you know meeting with other students, uh, it is, are you, so if, particularly if you're white identified, are you or other white individuals always the first to respond in class or in groups? Are you leaving space for other people to speak first? And I'm just noticing that, noticing who takes up the space. Um, and if, if there's a way that you personally can make a shift to that for yourself. So Aaron has really spoken to this notion of how to do this work and, and do it like more generally in different parts of your life with family, with friends and kind of your own personal practice. Um, it's also important though in, in, in being an, an ally and, and our commitment to anti-racism that we are also um, bettering ourselves at having these conversations and getting feedback from from individuals and specific, specifically um, you know um, the individuals in our life that do identify as people of color so we're going to talk about that for a minute and this is just the notion of i guess if there's a theme around this it is remaining open and receptive to being held accountable and and so um the first thing i will say is if we are given feedback that something we have done or said is biased, racist, racially insensitive, microaggressive in some form or fashion, it's important that we take a breath, that we listen, that we really avoid the urge to explain ourselves, defend ourselves, and instead just really understand. And, and, and also not understand like in a patronizing way, but just really in a way of like, wow, I'm, really sorry like i am hearing you and and that sounds awful and i'm just sitting with the notion that this is something that i did and i enacted so that belief that belief that this occurred it might be something we did it might be something they're telling us someone else did either way believing validating sitting with it you don't know and my my role is a, a supervisor and and um you know part of leadership here at utd how many times I have sat with staff of color who or students of color who have said to me like, yeah, they just didn't believe me. Like they kept like, I, I kept having to like retell the story and then they were asking for details. And, and I'm not certainly saying I've always done this perfect, but in my own process of learning and dismantling my own uh, biases and, and things I've been taught, I've certainly know the power of just sitting with it and believing and affirming that this happened and it's real. And there's a chance I just won't even understand it fully um, because I, I, I don't hold those identities and that's just so, so important. So really um, honoring the feelings that they um, are sharing um, as real and valid. Um, they may be angry with us or others that have hurt them and it's not our, it's not on us and it shouldn't be on us to, to resolve that right away in the sense of making the anger go away. That anger could be really valid. The other thing I want to talk about is this intent versus impact. This notion that we oftentimes will get the pull when we're uncomfortable, when we're trying to defend ourselves, even when we really care about someone, that we want to share out more of our intention. Oh gosh, I didn't mean to do that. My, I was really just trying to like help you to know that this was actually how it was supposed to be. And and we're 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 explaining our intent there, but we're not recognizing the impact it has. So what we want to encourage you to do is again take that breath can take a step back and instead really validate the intent. Wow, that feels really awful that, that this happened and, and I'm hearing the way now that that's making you feel and I, I would not want that. And, and I can really see that's had a lot of impact on you. But again, we're not going back to, but this was my intention. My intention wasn't to hurt you. That's just now how it feels. It's not about that. And I mean, it is, I mean, we certainly don't want to, um, we also aren't trying to um, propose or um, celebrate people having horrible intentions um, versus at least those who hold good enough intentions. But we are just saying that in the process of, of being an ally, it is about holding the impact, not holding the intention and just really, really focusing on that um, for yourself. And, and when you're sitting, when you're sitting with someone that's sharing with you. 
Um, also just avoiding critiquing or focusing on how the feedback was presented. Um, often there could be a focus on like the, the timing of it, the tone. Um, those are all laced with, with also white supremacy and idealisms around how things are given. So just to offer, you know, we have heard all too many times people say, oh, well, they were so aggressive in how they said that. Mm, that's, that's really could be really layered, layered with some racist, racial ideals and, and discrimination. And, and so just really paying attention to this notion of like, people really should be allowed to give feedback the way they need to give feedback and, and us paying attention to, again, what are, what are, what are the ways in which we're holding some ideals around that? Um, and again, I it add also, one thing to that, Jenna. Oh yeah. I just, what you're, when you're saying that, I think one thing I wanted to add is this idea that anger is a reasonable reaction to racism. So yeah. just wanting to highlight that, I think there are times you, know, you can hear like the, the therapist in us, like there are times when anger is a totally valid, reasonable reaction. And when, when a person is experiencing racism or oppression or um, overt discrimination, microaggressions, anger is totally, totally reasonable and valid. And so if someone is um, really upset or yelling or raising their voice or sharing feedback in that way, it's related to what I think to us feels like such a reasonable reaction. So just wanting to to highlight highlight that or can add to what Jenna was sharing. And I'm so glad you did. And we saw that even come up with like the protests and like how people are protesting in this notion of like, how, you know, that there was a specific way and it's like people are angry and like there's there's valid reason that they're angry. And, and so just again, really holding the notion of our ideals around that. Um, also though, in, in holding ideals around it, it can shift the attention away from again, what maybe we have done or someone else has done and, and back onto this person. And really, you know, that should not be happening. I think another piece is apologize. Apologize, learn from your mistakes, commit to changing your behavior. Um, oftentimes when we when we ask folks, um, what do you wish you had heard? You know, so in moments that they do feel further harmed in sharing out the way they were microaggressed against or discriminated or tokenized, when we go back and say like, what did you wish that had happened? This is a lot of times what, what is said. I mean, uh, apology, recognition, accountability to learn and move forward. Um, and so just so important to hold that for ourselves. And using your new knowledge to educate others. So this is really an opportunity for your, not only for yourself to learn, but something new you can share with others around you. So especially if you hold leadership roles, if you're within other systems, if you're in a student org, sharing these things out um, is certainly so, so important. Um, you know, just thinking about detaching from having to be one of the good ones. So again, like this notion, like we are all in this journey. We are all in this journey together. And so um, really just trying to also recognize the moments that you also still are learning and, and growing in this process too. And again, trying to really challenge avoiding or retreating due to discomfort um, in the increased awareness of white privilege. Instead, slow down, um, embrace humility, integrate what you're learning, and really work to build yourself as an anti-racist ally. So again, it, it's, a, it, 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 it's, it's a process that's so important. It can be uncomfortable, and, and that, that discomfort is important, though, to, to sit in and to stay in. So I'll shift it back to Erin to, to now share out some of our resources. And just one more thought I'll add before I shift is when I you know, hear Jenna talking about apologizing, I will frequently hear, as so I'll just encourage us to be watching for this in our language, I will hear people say, I'm sorry you feel that way, right? And so that is something that we really want to make a pivot on because the I'm sorry you feel that way really then puts on the person like that's just a reaction you are having versus if we are apologizing and taking accountability. Because that's really what this workshop is for today. This is really around um, people taking accountability as part of engaging in anti-racism. So it's, I am sorry for the words that I said. I am sorry that I hurt you. So it's about you know apologizing for what I have done versus I'm sorry you're having that reaction. Um, so just one other thing I wanted to, to add to that that I was thinking of as you were talking. Um, so as we move towards wrapping up, I think wanted to just note some of the resources that we included on the handout. And because it is important that we're continually educating ourselves to keep you know the conversations, this momentum going and really recognizing it is a privilege to be able to turn away from social media and the news and just not think about racism, right? And um, I think so much emotional labor 
from BIPOC folks has gone into creating resources and articles and podcasts and books. And it is really the responsibility and responsibility for white identified folks to read these resources and put in the work to educate ourselves because there's so much out there. So just drawing attention to um, you know, resources at UTD, I think using the Multicultural Center is an important resource. Um, there is a Living Our Values Task Force, if you're not familiar with, really encourage you to um, look at that and the initiatives coming through that at UTD, because that is a very important task force and initiative at UTD right now, have included um, a, a video from the Student Counseling Center related to addressing anti-Asian discrimination. Would really, really encourage folks to look through the articles um, and resource library. So all of the articles in that section, those are all things that we pulled from for this handout and for this training. So that's really our, our reference list. These are all the things that we were looking at and referencing. And there's so many fantastic examples in these resources, uh, very specific ways to engage in anti-racism. Um, there are podcasts you can listen to, right? So I think we wanted to be considering what are the, the different ways, different learning styles or you know, just different um, methods for being able to engage in learning. And so it may be that while you're getting ready in the morning, you have a podcast playing in the background. And like maybe that's what you have time for. Or if you are driving somewhere, can play that. So you're able to still um, you know, listen to these pieces and learn on your drive. There are books that we've included on here, as well as um, some specific movies, documentary shows. So these are just some examples. I think there's there's a lot of opportunity to really immerse ourselves in the resources because there's so much out there. So this would be just one additional way to be engaging in, in anti-racism. So we are going to start to wind down here. And so just want to kind of, as we wrap up, set some intentions and you can either make a note of this for yourself or feel free to put it in the chat or share out verbally if you want to share with the group. But we just want to ask this you know, wrapping up question, in what ways can you specifically individually commit to engaging in anti-racism? What are the next steps for you? Is there a particular article you'd like to just read this article over this next month? Is there a particular space in which you've observed some of these microaggressions, some of these racist patterns, and you're thinking about how you want to name that? So any particular intentions folks are setting that they'd like to share out with the group or any reflections and wind down comments as we, we wrap up. Also, if you have any questions too, certainly or thoughts, you could certainly put those in there too. appreciate the intentions shared in the chat of trying to be okay with uncomfortable conversations and focusing on impact instead of explaining intent. Yeah. So themes coming up around you know being able to like look at our own ego being able to keep that in check to feel better about owning up to mistakes and making sure i'm treating others with fairness and respect um yeah there's certainly no expectation that we're sharing out this workshop or that anyone should hold for themselves of being perfect all the time right we are all human and are going to make mistakes we are raised in a society that has you know systemic racism and oppression and white supremacy and it's important to be able just to recognize the reality of that and then explore the ways that we are perpetuating it engaging it and what are specific ways that we can be working on dismantling it 
um, even within our own sphere, within our own family, our workplace, for ourselves as individuals. What are steps that we can take? Um, recognizing this is a reality, but we can all individually take steps to dismantle that. So really appreciate folks' um, engagement in this conversation and openness and vulnerability in the conversation today. And I really hope you look over these resources are welcome to reach out to us if there are questions or you know, desire to be connected with more resources or with other folks on campus. And um, we certainly would be open to that. So anything else for you, Jenna, as we wrap up? No, just always appreciate those um, who, who join us in the space and having these conversations. And um, it's an ongoing process. So I hope, we hope as a um, as UTD community specifically that, that we continue to hold these, these spaces around being allies and, and what that looks like and what that means for us. So it just feels, feels important. And yes, I, I definitely um, hear what we're saying as far as that the bravery that comes with speaking up. Um, mm -hmm. And, and again, what we talk about, we didn't really talk about so much today, but this notion of inviting people in versus calling them out. So we say we call it calling in versus calling out, but certainly this notion that the more we put this out into work environments or places um, that we, we are with others, um, this notion that we we, we encourage it, we, we talk about, like at the counseling center, we talk about like, yes, we are gonna call each other in when we notice things happening or people may be holding a lens so that it can remove some of that discomfort or shame that's there and, verse, and, and instead be, be a learning opportunity um, to be able to have these conversations. So again, even putting out that, that to your um, kind of your, your center and uh, to your different spaces and people you're working with or around, this notion of, hey, I really want to start to be calling in when, when I'm hearing these things or when we hear this from each other and use this as a learning opportunity, I think can, can even give some of that permission and, and hopefully uh, make, maybe hopefully remove some of the risks that comes in, in, in doing it. Because yeah. I hope something that we can hold is that particularly for white uh, individuals, if a person of color um, gives us feedback on something that we have done is harmful or racist or microaggressive like that is a risk that someone is taking that is a vulnerability and like that is a gift that someone gives us that they are giving that opportunity to us to grow and to pivot and to be different and so being able to really hear it as such like this is something to feel gratitude for when we get the feedback because then we can engage differently and we can behave differently moving forward so okay right. thank you all so much and um, we'll be able to wrap up so folks can if you're going to the next uh, session able to, to transition. So thank you all so much. Thank you all.